verses 41 through 46. My message is entitled, What Think Ye of Christ? What Think Ye of Christ? Matthew chapter 22, and we're going to read verses 41 through 46. Let's all stand up, please, for the reading of God's Word. What Think Ye of Christ? Beginning with verse 41. It says, While the Pharisees were gathered together, Jesus asked them, saying, What think ye of Christ? Whose son is he? They said unto him, The son of David. He saith unto them, How then doth David in spirit, or under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, call him Lord, saying, The Lord, now notice that capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D, the uppercase letters. That's important. The Lord said unto my Lord, capital L, small O, R, D, Sit thou on my right hand till I make thine enemies thy footstool. If David then call him Lord, how is he his son? And no man was able to answer him a word. Neither durst they any man from that day forth ask him any more questions. What think ye of Christ? Let's go to the throne of grace. Our Father and our God, as we lift up the Lord Jesus Christ here this morning, as we've done in song, Father, we would pray that we would do it in the word. And Lord God, we take this message, we'd apply it to our lives. We'd ask ourselves, what think ye of Christ? Father, I pray you'd anoint this preacher with feet of clay. Lord, give me physical strength this morning, as well as a spiritual anointing, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen. And you may be seated. Now, beloved, this unusual passage of Scripture gives us some insight into the Christmas message regarding Christ's miraculous virgin birth. And it takes place during the Lord's last week while he was on earth, just before he got crucified. Jesus is in the temple. The day is Tuesday, beloved. And his authority and his claims of being the Messiah have been relentlessly challenged by the religious leaders. All they wanted to do was vehemently oppose him, try to prove him wrong in something. They were looking for anything they could to get him entrapped in his words. Why, beloved? Why did they want to do this? Because they wanted to kill him. You see, folks, they ask them all kinds of trick questions regarding Scripture and all kinds of trick questions regarding the Romans, trying to ensnare and entrap him in his words. Why? Because, beloved, what they wanted to do was either have the Jews kill him as an imposter, Messiah, or have the, Ro the Romans kill him for treason and sedition. But all failed because God, providentially, was watching over the whole thing. Would you say amen out there? God was orchestrating what was going on by his providential hand. Anyways, beloved, everything that they did, they desperately tried to hang him on the gallows of their own words, or his own words, but they failed. Now think about it, beloved. He was opposed by the Sadducees, but they failed. The Sadducees believed in the first five books of the Bible, the Decalogue, but they did not believe in the prophets or the Psalms. And they tried everything they could to entrap him, but they failed. And next, the scribes, the scribes were the lawyers. They were the theologians. They're the ones that really taught the Pharisees. And they tried everything they possibly could to entrap him and ensnare him in his words, but they also failed. And then, of course, the Herodians and the Pharisees, they stepped up to the plate, beloved. But his wisdom proved much too much for all of them because they all failed. Would you say amen? Beloved, each time Jesus answered them, he answered them so wisely, so skillfully, so scripturally that it silenced those opponents who challenged them of his claims of being the Messiah. He said, I am that Messiah that you've just read about, that I spoke to you about, that God has sent me down here to redeem you from the penalty of your sins. Nobody likes to talk today about the penalty of sin, do they? They did it in Jesus' day. You see, beloved, everybody gets comfortable in religion. But I want to tell you something. I couldn't belong to a church that didn't challenge me. I want to be uncomfortable in my seat. I want to know what the Word of God says. How about you? So now, beloved, what happens is this. Jesus literally turns the tables on them and he begins his counterattack. How does he do it? By asking them a probative and a provocative question in verse 42 regarding the Messiah of whose descendant he would be. That he would be a descendant of King David. Now, Jesus did this, beloved, not to try to entrap them like they were trying to do to him. That's not the nature of our Lord. The Lord doesn't try to entrap us in anything. Amen? The reason Jesus did this, he was trying to test them, beloved. He was trying to test their knowledge. 
their knowledge of the scriptures. How in the world do they interpret the scriptures? And if they interpret it correctly, how could they overlook this? How could they not see this profound truth that was written by King David back in Psalm 110? That's what we're talking about. You see, what our Lord wanted to do was enlighten their minds, beloved, give them the true meaning of scriptures. Christ wasn't trying to best them as an opponent, but expose and correct their error so they could see the truth. If Christ wanted anything, he wanted them to see the truth. You see, folks, Jesus was reaching out to them in hope. Why? Hoping that some of them would at least recognize him as the Messiah and some of them would be saved. You see, Jesus wanted them to embrace his Messiahship. He wanted them to accept him as the Son of God, beloved, and personally become their Lord and Savior. But they could not do it unless they understood the Scriptures. I wouldn't give you a dime, not a dime, for a pastor who did not explain the Scriptures to his people. There's not much of that going on today, much exegesis of Scripture. And Christians are leaving their churches dumbed down just with feel-good messages, not understanding what the Word of God has to say. You see, beloved, the spirit of his questioning to them with this difficult question was not to demean them. It was not to belittle them, beloved. Rather, it was to, he did it in a spirit of humility. He did it in a spirit of teaching and enlightening and provoking their minds because he wanted them to truly understand the scriptures. If they were interpreted correctly, if they were interpreted spiritually like they should have been, beloved, they'd have known all about the Messiah and they would have seen that he was indeed the very one David was speaking about way back yonder in Psalm 110. Would you say amen? Oh, listen to me, beloved. Christ was patient and he was long-suffering and he's tender. He was trying to be patient, long-suffering, tender in those because there was some in the audience that wanted to hear it. But you hear me now, beloved, those who seek the Lord, those who seek Christ Messiah, God deals with them in a tender, long-suffering, and a patient way. Conversely, those who do not, beloved, who know the truth about Christ but will not accept it, will not obey it, and then he deals with them in a very harsh and sharp and caustic way because they recognize the truth about him, but they will not submit. They will not admit to it. So the question is, which one are you? Are you one who says, I see it, Lord. I'm going to surrender my life to you. I believe that you are indeed the very Lord and Savior, the Messiah, the Mashiach, who they've been speaking about. Or I see the truth, but I'm not going to obey it anyways. I'm going to do my own thing. You see, beloved, I want you to hear me now. Christ did not come to condemn us. A lot of people think that. We were already condemned. Christ came down to save us. Would you say amen out there? But you see, beloved, as then, so now. In other words, even people in his day recognized, religious leaders recognized that he was indeed the Messiah, but they did not want to admit it because they did not want to lose their position or have the Romans take them out of their position. They love control like we see going on with the governments today, amen? And this whole pandemic, what went on, how to control people, herd mentality, and put things out there and brainwash them and... Say you got experts with the degrees at the end of their name, and half of them, beloved, don't know the... Never mind. <laughs> they don't know what they're talking about. <laughs> but, beloved, as then, so now. A lot of people are like that today, but I'm asking you, what say ye of Christ? What say ye of Christ, beloved? You know, this is one of the most important... This is the one of the most profound and provocative questions ever asked to people on the top side of this earth because one's eternal destiny in either heaven or hell depends on that person correctly and rightly interpreting who this Christ, who this Son really is. Because you can't make a mistake in this, beloved, because there's too much at stake. Would you say amen out there? You see, beloved, some say he was just a man. Do you? And some say he was just a prophet. Do you just think that? He was like Muhammad or some other false prophet? Some say that he was just a good moral and spiritual teacher. Do you think that? Beloved, he couldn't have been a good moral and spiritual teacher when he was saying he was the son of God. He'd have been, he'd have been crazy. He'd have been insane for me to believe that if he was just a good moral teacher. And yet he's saying he's the son of God. You see, others said he was a fake that he was a fraud, 
Can you imagine his own people? He came to his own nation and creation, John says in John chapter 1, but they received him not. But as many as received him, them, he gave the power to become the sons of God. But many in Israel called him a fake Messiah at that time. So I guess my question is, what say you about Christ? Is he your Messiah? Is he your personal master? Is he your personal king and Lord, beloved? Who is this Christ to you? Now, what I want to be able to do by way of introduction here is I want to look at these texts. I want us to delve into these texts so we can uncover the insightful spiritual truths implied by Jesus' profound question, what think ye of Christ? The first thing I want you to see is Christ's profound question. The Christ's Profound question. Look what he says in verses 42 and 45. Saying, what think ye of Christ, or the Messiah? That's the, that word means the anointed one, Christos. The anointed one, the Mashiach, the Messiah. Whose son is he? They say unto him, the son of David. Drop right down to verse 45. If David then call him Lord, how is he his son? Beloved, in other words, how can both be true unless mysteriously, this Lord is both God and man. You see, beloved, Jesus now counterattacks these antagonistic religious leaders. These who are always hostily and aggressively challenging him time and again. Why? Because they wanted to embarrass him before the crowds. They wanted to discredit him before the crowds. But notice, beloved, in these texts, that Jesus does not ask them who they think that he is. A lot of people gloss right over that. See, Jesus didn't say, who do you think I am? He didn't say that, ladies and gentlemen, because these religious leaders had already stated who he was. They thought he was someone who had been born of fornication. They spoke about him derogatively already. They said he was a son, an illegitimate son of a Roman soldier. Others said he was nothing but Beelzebub. He was demon-possessed that he was the false messiah, that he was an imposter. So Jesus full well knew what these people, these critics, were already saying about them. That's why he did not say, who do you think I am? He said, what think ye of David or, or Christ? Whose son is he? In other words, beloved, what he tried to do is bring them to the, the, the word of God. So he asked them, whose son is the coming messiah? Who would he would descend from? And notice, they immediately, they knew, and they correctly interpreted, they said he's the son of David. Why did they say that? Because all of the Old Testament scriptures, beloved, had taught in many places that David's son, the greater son, the greater David would come, and he would be the Mashiach of Israel. He would be the Messiah. He would be the Lord and the Savior of the world. So, beloved, they correctly interpreted that. But then in verses 43 through 45, I love the way Jesus did this, beloved, because he goes to the underlying issue of the matter regarding the true nature and being of the Messiah. That's what they had missed all along. Sure, he's the son of David. You see, they didn't see that the son of David was also Lord. So they didn't understand the nature or the being of this Messiah. So Jesus here in verse 44, beloved, he quotes Psalm 110, 1 to them, which said this, The Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou at thy right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool. Now notice that first word, Lord, like I told you as I read it to you. It's all uppercase letters, capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D. Now if we go back to the Hebrew in Psalm 110, that word is Yehovah. The Greek equivalent, because in the word Lord in the New Testament, whether it's uppercase or lowercase, is kurios. But really, we could say theos, because it's referring to the God of Israel, the eternal self-existent one. The Old Testament Jews called him Yahweh. They called him Yahovah, Yahuwah. All right, so they knew exactly who this Lord was. It was God Almighty himself. Would you say amen out there? But Jesus doesn't stop there. He uses the second word, Lord, capital L, small o-r-d. That's important that we understand that. In other words, beloved, what he was saying is this. is the Lord, that is God the Father, said to Adonai. That was the word in the Hebrew back in Psalm 110. The Greek equivalent is the word kurios. 
In other words, beloved, it refers to the Messiah, the divine master of heaven and earth. That word Adonai was used as the Old Testament covenant-keeping God of Israel whom they had worshipped. Now everything seemed pretty good until Christ starts putting their feet in the fire to open their eyes because he wanted the blinders to fall off. Would you say amen? Now, beloved, look at verse 45. He says, if David then call him Lord, how is he his son? You see, beloved, King David lived approximately 1,000 years before Christ when he made this prophecy about the Messiah being both his son and also his Lord. So Christ asked, how can the Messiah be King David's Lord first, a thousand years before he ever became his son? Now that's a pretty profound question, isn't it, when Jesus is challenging them? In other words, beloved, what he's saying is the spiritual truth that Jesus is trying to drive home and bring out to get them to see was that King David's greatest son, the Messiah, was also first his Lord. He was his superior a thousand years before he ever brought forth that descendant through his loins. So there's something mysterious that's going on here. There's something spiritual that the Jews had overlooked, that these religious leaders had overlooked. And a lot of people miss it, beloved, because they interpret the Bible hyper-literally and they don't collate all the facts so they can't make a right interpretation or exegesis of what the scripture is saying. That was the mistake that the Sadducees, the Herodians, the Pharisees, the scribes all made. So Jesus is asking him a very profound question here. You see, King David would have never addressed a mere human being as his Lord, because if he did that, that would have been rank idolatry. That would have been a violation of the first and second commandment of God's law, and that would have been punishable by death. It was a capital crime to worship anyone else except Yehovah, the Lord God of Israel. Would you say amen out there? And so therefore, beloved, King David, whom they revered, foresaw and recognized that the Messiah who was to come through his loins would be both human and divine. That is, God now manifest in the flesh. flesh. God manifesting himself, appearing as a human being. Now what Christ wanted them to have was a eureka moment. Many of you today may be having that. Many watching me by television or YouTube may have that eureka moment because they never understood what Jesus was driving at here. And so, beloved, he wanted them to understand this profound spiritual truth that David wrote about, that David prophesied about. You see, beloved, David was writing under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 19 and 20 says, No prophecy of the Scripture of any private interpretation, For the prophecy came not in the old time by the will of men, but holy men of God spake as they were moved or borne along, blown along by the Holy Ghost. Would you say amen out there? You see, beloved, this is why and how David was able to call his son the Messiah and also his Lord a thousand years before uh, Jesus was ever born in the flesh. You know, when Paul was writing to young Pastor Timothy, he was a young buck, just starting out in the ministry. And beloved, uh, when the ministry hits you, it, it's like running into a freight train, believe me when I tell you. And so in, G, in, in, in uh, Paul's day, and with young Pastor Timothy, he was being challenged many times by a lot of these quote-unquote Jewish theologians. So Paul said this, the young pastor Timothy in 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16. He says, and without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh. God was justified in the spirit. He was seen of angels. He was believed on in the world. And he was received up in the glory, talking about his ascension. But think about it. God was manifest in the flesh. Manifest is who? The Mashiach. The Messiah. God was manifest as the Messiah who was a human being. He was human. He was divine when he walked this earth. That's what David foresaw 1,000 years before Christ. Come on and say amen out there. So, beloved, Christ's intriguing and insightful question utterly baffled. It confounded. It perplexed these religious leaders. Why? Because they had never correctly Uh, and spiritually interpret this text the the way they should have been. They had completely overlooked the profound spiritual truth that David was trying to teach them. 
that the coming Messiah had to be more than just a mere mortal man, beloved, or David would have never said this. But was indeed the Lord, the Lord going to be made flesh in his own son that would come through his loins. In other words, as I've taught you in the past, he would be the theanthropos. That word theanthropos means this. It means the God-man. It means, beloved, that he would be deity now enshrined, enshrouded, enfleshed in humanity. Something spiritual, something mystical, something miraculous was going to happen. Would you say amen out there? You see, beloved, he'd be both fully God and fully man. That's what David was showing him. He'd both be God's perfect man and man's perfect God. He'd be both the son of God and son of man. And so Christ was challenging them to rightly interpret King David's words and testimony, beloved, concerning his descendant, the Messiah. In other words, saying, he's saying to them, you got it all wrong. What, how could you have overlooked this? You see, Jesus wanted them to see this inevitable and this inescapable conclusion uh, and was in perfect in harmony with what the scriptures had taught about the Messiah coming and being both a human and divine being. You see, beloved, had not the scriptures said in Isaiah 7, 14, the fifth gospel, Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and his name shall be called Emmanuel, God with us. God with us in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. In other words, speaking about his miraculous virgin birth, Speaking about, ladies and gentlemen, how he's going to be born through a virgin. He was going to be the eternal word made flesh, appearing to mankind on this earth. And had not the scripture said in Isaiah 9, 6, and 7, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulders, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counsel of the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace, of the increase of his government and peace, there shall be no end, upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom, to order it and to establish it with judgment and with justice from henceforth, even forever. Didn't the prophet Isaiah say that? What's the matter with you guys? Aren't you reading the scriptures? Why can't you interpret it? How did you miss it? See, that's what he wanted him to see. And had not the scripture said in Micah 5, 5 2, but thou Bethlehem Ephrata, though thou be little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of thee shall he come forth unto me who shall be ruler in all Israel. Now listen, whose going forth have been of old from everlasting. Oh, beloved, listen to me now. There were two Bethlehems in Jesus' day. The word Bethlehem means house of bread. Jesus said he was the bread of life. Amen. But in Jesus' day, there were two Bethlehems. There was Bethlehem Zebulon. Bethlehem, Bethlehem Zebulon was a thriving metropolis. Metropolis, metropolis. <laughs> Don't go topless, okay. <laughs> it was a thriving metropolis, ladies and gentlemen. It was known to be, for some intelligentsia to be located there. Conversely, Bethlehem Ephrata was this little kibbutz that maybe two or three hundred, maybe four hundred people lived in. And Micah said, when Messiah is born, he will pinpoint the exact place. It will be from Bethlehem, Ephrata. Would you say amen out there? The very place that King David himself was born and his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, would be born. Come on and say amen out there. In other words, beloved, Mike had also said that he was going to be a ruler over all Israel, but he said his goings forth had been from everlasting. In other words, his going forth had been from eternity past. He lived in the dateless, timeless, eternal past into the dateless, timeless, eternal future. There was something unique about David's son, this Lord saying unto his Lord, sit thou on my right hand till I make thine enemies thy footstool. Come on and say amen out there. Now, beloved, Jesus wanted these religious leaders, just like he wants all people in this world to understand the messianic prophecies concerning his humanity and his divinity, because a lot of people trip over that. How can God become a man? <laughs> Listen, beloved, how can God create everything by speaking the word? Just speak it into existence. Ex nihilio, everything out of nothing by the almighty in the uh, supernatural power of his spoken word. How can he do it? Well, he can do it because he's almighty God. Would you say amen? So God wants mankind to come to him for forgiveness. He wants mankind to come to him for salvation, for eternal life, beloved. But I want you to notice what these scriptures teach about the Messiah in Psalm 110 and right here as Jesus is quoting them. 
There's four truths that he says here. He says they reveal his number one, his pre-existence. Look what it says in verse 44a. The Lord said unto my Lord, let me stop you there. Notice, beloved, as I told you before, 1,000 years before Christ's birth as David's son, David already called and worshipped him as his Lord, as his king. In other words, he'd already existed both before and at the time of David as his Lord and master, and yet he had not yet been born in the flesh as one of David's descendants. Amen? You see, but during the time of King David, this coming Messiah was already Lord. He was already David's king, beloved. But he had not yet entered into time and space via the flesh, beloved, or his miraculous incarnation. He had not yet come as Emmanuel, God was with us. You see, the Old Testament said this was going to happen, but it hadn't happened yet. And that's why I have great umbrage with these people who set dates about the coming of the Lord. They've all been wrong. You know, I, I remember doing a study one time. In fact, I had to do a paper on it. Uh, from Hal Lindsey to, to a lot of the dispensationalists, to all these books that came out, Christ is coming at such and such a date, and they're mathematically and uh, algebraically trying to uh, pick the date, and they're going to defeat. And they've all been wrong, 22 of them, since the time of Christ. Irenaeus, the church fathers, they were all wrong. You see, Jesus will come when he's ready to come. Amen. The Lord is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. The Lord is not slack concerning his promises, some men call slackness. But is willing, uh, not willing that any should perish, but all should come to repentance. That's 2 Peter 2 9. See, God is patient because he wants men to be saved. He doesn't want them condemned, he doesn't want them to be damned. Amen. So, beloved, here, Christ teaches these religious leaders, and he teaches us that he's both God the Son and the Son of God who existed in the dateless, timeless, eternal, past, present, and future. But the question is, have you worshipped him as your Lord? Have you worshipped him as your Messiah? Have you worshipped him as your King, beloved? Just who is Jesus to you? Is he just another religious leader to you? Is he just another enlightened one to you? Is he just another guru to you? What say you of Christ? What think ye of Christ? Not only does it show his preeminence, beloved, but secondly, notice it shows his position. Look at verse 44b. He said, sit thou on thy right hand. Let me hold it there. Sit thou. See that word, sit thou? Kathemai means that God told David's Lord and Messiah to permanently and forever sit enthroned on his throne to rule and reign with him over the universe, signifying his sovereign power and authority, just like Almighty God. Would you say amen out there? In other words, I want you to sit down, Jesus. I want you to stay sat down because you are now ruling and reigning throughout the universe. Sit thou. Showing permanence right there. King David in Psalm 89, verses 35 through 36, said, Once have I sworn in my holiness that I will not lie unto David. His seed, that is King Jesus the Lord, shall endure forever and his throne as the sun before me. In other words, God became man in the person of Jesus Christ, the Mashiach. Would you say amen? Hey, you know what? That's the Christmas message, isn't it? That's what Christmas was supposed to be all about. Emmanuel, God becoming man, walking this earth in the flesh. And you know the Bible says there was nothing comely about him that we would recognize we all see these pictures of Jesus with long flowing hair and blue eyes. But you know, he, he was an ordinary guy like me. Dark skin, probably like me. And just an ordinary person. They say, how can that person ever be God? Because they missed the spiritual truth that the scriptures were teaching throughout the Old Testament about the coming Messiah. Amen? That he'd be God appearing in the flesh. Not appearing as a ghost or a phantom or a three-dimensional hologram. He'd be God appearing in the flesh. So the question is, beloved, does he truly sit enthroned in your heart as your Lord and King? Does he truly sit enthroned in your soul as your Lord and King? How about in your life as your Lord and King? I'm saying, what think ye of Christ? Ye personally, what think ye of Christ? So, beloved, we see his preexistence, we see his position, but also this uh, scripture shows us his preeminence. 
Look what it says in verse 44b. He says, sit thou, and then he uses the words, at my right hand, dexios, means that David's Lord and Son already sits next to God on the throne of the universe. In other words, this Lord is God's right hand man, if you will, endowed with the same power and authority God has. And beloved, we know as we study the scriptures, to sit at the right hand of someone, to sit at the right hand of a king, especially right here, the King of kings and the Lord of lords, to sit and be at the right hand of God is the highest and greatest place of prominence and prestige with God. It's the greatest position, beloved, the greatest place of exaltation and honor, the greatest position of dignity and nobility with God. So this denotes that David's Lord and Son is much more than just a mere man. He's much more than just a mere mortal. And he's much more than just some human monarch that people were used to at that time ruling and reigning on this earth. And so, beloved, sitting enthroned and coronated at God's right hand indicates that this Messiah and God-man is truly the King of kings, isn't he? And truly the Lord of lords in both heaven and earth. The question is, though, how in the world, as I've meditated on this, how in the world did these religious leaders miss this? How did they miss How did they deny this truth? How did they even reject this truth about the Messiah now being embodied in the person of a human being, namely Jesus Christ, that walked this earth? The word Jesus is the Greek word for Joshua. Yeshua, okay? Remember one time my my son Jacoby was small, uh, and he said to me, what was, Daddy, what was... What was uh, Jesus' name in Hebrew? I said, Yeshua. And Kobe says, I'm positive. <laughs> I threw him out the window anyway. But, uh... No, you see, beloved, what I'm saying to you is this here. Surely it was because of their willful blindness and their unbelief, their hardness of heart. I know it's true, but I don't want to believe it. I know that it's true, but I'll have to change my life if he's really uh, uh, preaching the truth of what God has to say. Beloved, you see, that's what Christianity is all about. It's about change, isn't it? It's about a radical transformation that takes place in us via the power of the Holy Spirit, supernaturally done. So what are you saying, preacher? I'm saying, what think ye of Christ? The fourth thing he showed us in this psalm was his predominance. Look what he says in verse 44c. He says, till I make thine enemies my, thy footstool." Now, beloved, that may not mean much to us right now. But in biblical days, this was a familiar Hebraic idiom that signifies God's divine promise, his guarantee to the Messiah that he will utterly crush and conquer all of his enemies and adversaries, that he will utterly overwhelm, he'll overpower, he will, uh, 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 I already said overcome, didn't he? Yeah, he would defeat and destroy all his enemies. In other words, this was a given from God's perspective already, wasn't it? In fact, the Bible says that Christ's crucifixion was in accordance with the determinate counsel of God. God had orchestrated Jesus being arrested, Jesus going to the cross. You see, beloved, the cross was God's idea. The crucifixion was man's idea. I've taught you that before, and I'm not going to go there right now for brevity of time. What I am saying to you is right now Christ sits on the throne of the universe and he sits at the right hand of God ruling and reigning over the mediatorial kingdom, that spiritual kingdom on this earth. And the Bible says, according to Psalm 2, he does it with a rod of iron. And figuratively, beloved, he ends up putting his sandal right on the neck. When you would conquer someone, the conqueror would take his foot and he put it right on the neck of those people that he conquered, showing that he... And he alone was the conqueror. And so as a divine victor, beloved, he will totally overwhelm. When he comes, he will totally subjugate. He will dominate. He will vanquish and triumph for all those who rose up against him during his lifetime while he was here on earth. You know, as we read the apocalypse, we read the last book of the Bible, the seer of Patmos on the eye, uh, as he writes seeing all of these visions, you know, and that's why I've taught you the book of Revelation is not, now listen to me, chronological. Okay, John is caught in a vortex and he's going around and he's just writing as he sees these visions appear and he's writing them down. 
But all of these things, beloved, are found throughout the rest of the clear scriptures, and so we know what John's talking about for the most part. Would you say amen out there? But when John's seeing how the book of Revelation is about the Lamb, it's about the Lord, it's about Him being the Lion, and it's about Him being the victor, would you say amen? And we know that at the battle of Armageddon, John says in Revelation chapter 17, verse 14, he says that these enemies of mine, these opponents, these critics of mine, shall make war with the Lamb, he says, but the Lamb shall overcome them. Would you say amen? Why? Because Revelation 5 says that that lamb is the lion of the tribe of Judah. Come on and say amen out there. Yeah, you know, I love it. <laughs> God says to John in Revelation chapter 5, he says, I want you to look at the lion from the tribe of Judah. So John looks and it's a lamb who had been slain. In other words, you see the mysteries, beloved, the spiritual truths that God's showing us. Sure, he's the conqueror, but he's also the sacrifice, the substitute, the sin bearer. And that's how he becomes the conqueror of sin, death, hell, and the grave. Come on and say amen out there. You see, beloved, what I'm saying to you is this, is that that's not the end of the story because Jesus said this in Revelation 3, 25, uh, 21 also. He says, To him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne even as I overcame and have sat down with my father's throne. We're going to share ruling and reign with Jesus throughout the universe. Remember I told you, heirs of God, join ears with Christ? So, beloved, what think ye of Christ? See, that was point number one, my four sub-points. The next two are close. Plenty of time. Close. Easy. I want you to see number two, the completely puzzled questionnaires. Look what he says in verse um, 46a. And no man was able to answer him a word. Not a word, beloved. Notice that these religious leaders, these uh, interrogators, these inquisitors who angrily and conspiringly faced off to cross-examine him now regretfully realized that they had been far outmatched by this, quote, God in the flesh, whose name was Jesus Christ. In other words, he had the wisdom of God, didn't he? You see, beloved, both their prideful and piety and ignorance of the Scriptures left them both utterly perplexed and speechless as to just how to answer Jesus' profound and probative and provocative question. In other words, it utterly astonished and astounded them, and it left them dumbstruck. Okay, how can David call him his Lord then? That's all, folks. <laughs> that was a profound question, wasn't it? You know what? If they asked me that, I would have known. If I were in that shoe, because if you're, you're a theologian, these are the things you need to study, you need to get the root of things, amen? Wisdom is the principal thing, therefore get wisdom. With all thy getting, get understanding, it says in Proverbs 1.7. With all thy getting, get understanding. And so, beloved, they met their match. And they were humiliated because they now saw that Jesus, not them, had indeed correctly interpreted this King David's messianic psalm about his son, the Messiah, having to be both human and divine, for David then would have never have called him Lord. And so the Bible warns. Now listen to me. The Bible warns that the mouths of all of Christ's critics and cynics will be stopped someday. And the Bible warns that the mouths of all of Christ's detractors and doubters someday will be stopped. You see there shooting out the lip right now. They think that they're getting away with it, but they're going to be held accountable for every idle word someday that they said against Christ, won't they? Yet the mouths of all of Christ's skeptics and scoffers, beloved, down through the ages, are not only going to be stopped, but they'll be silenced forever. And they'll literally fall prostrate and flat on their faces on that great and terrible day of judgment below and now mournfully confess that what they heretofore had vehemently denied, namely that Jesus Christ is indeed the Lord. In Romans chapter 4, 14, excuse me, in verse 11, Paul quoting Isaiah says this, that at the name of Jesus every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So listen to me now. You either bow to him willfully while you can, or you will bow to him forcefully in that day of judgment. 
So now's the time if you're going to bow your knee. Amen? So, beloved, what think ye of Christ? Whose son is he? Who is he to you? Is he just a biological son of Mary and Joseph, as a lot of people say? Is he just the Ill- illegitimate son of a Roman soldier, as other people say? Or is he the only begotten son of the living God, as the Bible says? Would you say amen out there? And he's your Lord and your Savior. What think ye of Christ? And lastly, beloved, I'll close with this. Not only have we seen the Christ profound question, the completely puzzled question is, but I want you to look at the critical pundits quieted. <laughs> look what he says in verse 46b. He says, Neither durst any man from that day forth ask him any more questions. You see, beloved, they saw the difficult dilemma they were now been, had been in. And they've been reduced to, and now they're afraid of Jesus. In other words, they're trying to embarrass him before the crowds, but Jesus' answers is actually backfiring on them, and they're being embarrassed before the crowds. But the Bible tells us here that there'd be no more attacks or ask Jesus these shrewd questions to try to trip him up anymore, would they? No matter how hard they try, there'd be no more of that. There'd be no more uh, seeking an occasion trying to entrap him in his own words. From that day forth, beloved, there'd be no more. They would never dare to ever debate him. He completely silenced them, and that's why they refused to answer him. They did not know what to say. They had plenty to say before that, though, didn't they? They got people's ear and people who do not know the Scriptures, beloved, and they were able to twist it and turn it so they would look to them as their quote-unquote gods with a small g-o-d-s, as the Bible says, quoted in Psalm 89, meaning rulers. Jesus used that, uh, haven't I not called you gods or rulers? What am I saying to you, beloved? Let me close with this. God pleads. He literally pleads with all mankind to be saved. To accept Christ, this human and divine being, this Lord and Savior, as being their own. That's why the church exists on earth, so we can share the gospel with folks, so they can come to know Christ. But you know, in the Old Testament, when the prophets would preach and the people would argue with the prophets, they did with all of them, said, name one of the prophets you have been persecuted or stoned or cut in half or crucified. Name one. Because nobody likes to hear a prophet of God. And you know, people walk around today saying they're a prophet of God. You don't want to be a prophet of God, beloved. Imagine you have to walk into the White House right up to the king and tell him right to his face exactly what God said. <laughs> uh, then run for your life. <laughs> you know what God says to them? God said this in the Old Testament. You've come to me with these little arguments. And they said, what do you mean? He says, plead your cause. Show me if there's any merit to what you're arguing, why you won't and don't accept what I say or ultimately embrace my Messiah that I've sent to you. Plead your cause. Now you see, the Bible says their mouth will be stopped. Their mouth will be silenced forever. Amen. In Revelation chapter 22, verse 16, the capstone of this whole sermon, Jesus said this. Listen. He said, I am the root and the offshoot or offspring of David. Now listen, beloved. Christ was not only David's root, as being the Lord, but he was his shoot, his offshoot from the stem of Jesse, his father, right? So he'd be human and he'd be divine. Christ was David's king. Christ was David's Lord, beloved. The question is, is he your root? Are you his son? And have you made him your Lord? What think ye of Christ? You know, Christmas is more than Christmas trees and Lighted trees and wreaths and creches and manger scenes and gifts and presents under the tree, ladies and gentlemen. It's all about God becoming a man. Emmanuel, God with us in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. Would you say amen? You know, Jesus' profound question silenced all of his critics then. And he will silence them all 
since then into the future till the day Jesus returns. But you know what, beloved? His converts won't be eternally damned like the, these, these people who are critics. They'll be converted and they will live forever and ever in the eternal kingdom of God. Amen. So what are you saying, Pastor Joel? And I want you to be honest this morning. What think ye of Christ? Whose son is he? Mary and Joseph's son? Whose son is he? Roman soldier's son? Whose son is he? The only begotten son of God. What think ye of Christ? Let's go to the throne of grace.